Being a soldier is considered a profession. Military craft has its intricacies and methods of work that are called army regulations and safety rules. It's no wonder because in the battlefield the cost of the slightest mistake is the life of a soldier or an innocent citizen. On May 15, 2015, two soldiers were killed on the battlefields of the Russian-Ukrainian war. Another fighter died in a hospital from injuries he sustained in the throes of war. Traditionally, the situation around the Donetsk airport remained tense, but the enemy also became more active in the north, near the village of Stanitsa Luhanska. On May 16, as a result of shelling, the 30th Brigade lost two soldiers on the Svitlodar Ark, which is located right in the nucleus of the ATO zone. But the mass media mainly focused on the events that happened near the town of Shastya. You are watching the 54th series of the film The History of the War. In 2014, the Russian Federation committed an act of armed aggression against Ukraine. The war has lasted for several years. We're following the course of events in this war, tracing the links between military operations, diplomacy, policy and economics, and are trying to understand how it went down and, most importantly, why it happened. At about 2.30 p.m., the facade stronghold was attacked. The enemy group secretly approached the Ukrainian positions, intending to seize them. But guard junior sergeant of the 92nd Brigade Pugachev found the enemy in time and sounded the battle alarm, which basically undermined and destroyed the terrorist plans of attack. The battle broke out during which Vadim Pugachev was fatally wounded. But thanks to his timely actions, the attack was repelled and the enemy quickly retreated. Pursuing the saboteurs that retreated, Ukrainian soldiers of the 92nd Brigade seized two wounded militants, who were members of the 3rd Special Forces Brigade of the Russian Armed Forces. <laughs> Trying to cover their tracks, the militants used mortar fire against the place where the wounded Russians were lying. However, Ukrainian soldiers successfully evacuated them and provided them the necessary medical assistance. In addition to that, a special sniper rifle Vinterez was seized. This Russian weapon is not produced in Ukraine and has never been used by any Ukrainian security agency. In response to the events that took place, both Russian propaganda and LPR officials unanimously declared that Yerofeyev and Alexandrov were not Russian servicemen, rather volunteers and served in the so-called LPR People's Militia. And indeed, the corresponding documents were found on their persons. However, the prisoners clearly affirmed that they were members of the Russian Armed Forces. They also named the number of the unit, the names of their commanders and colleagues, announced the tasks that their unit performed, and even made the rotation plan public. It's important to note that the saboteur's amenability is quite logical. Firstly, formally, any member of the so-called Novorossiya army is a terrorist. Considering the fact of the clashes with human victims, both Yerofeyev and Alexandrov could face serious terms in Ukrainian prisons in poor conditions. In more simple terms, no one can guarantee that other prisoners won't offend Russian terrorists in prison. At the same time, a prisoner of war status would ensure Russians safe conditions of detention and a quick exchange. The second reason for cooperating with the authorities is also trivial. The main task of any soldier in captivity is survival. And if this means testifying, then such a move is quite acceptable. Usually, the possibility of capturing soldiers and an information leak is taken into account in planning operations. Fighters are partially aware of the details of the plan and the army command often has a fallback. Not surprisingly, the next day, on May 17, 2015, all the groups of the Russian 3rd Special Force Brigade left Luhansk and Bryanka, where they had been based since March 2015, and departed to the point of permanent location. The enemy did not abandon its plans, it simply adapted to the situation. Meanwhile, the war continued in the ATO zone. Positional, slow, but still real. With real battles, 
casualties on landmines and ambushes of sabotage groups. On May 17, near the village of Troitska in the Popopnyansky County, a landmine was targeted at a UAZ vehicle of the 2nd Brigade of the National Guard of Ukraine. The vehicle delivered volunteer aid to the positions of the division. As a result of the blast, the brigade support had his driver, two civil activists and one volunteer suffered severe burns. On May 19, on the Bakhmut Highway near the village of Katerinivka, the military noticed movement in the woods line and after conducting reconnaissance found abandoned militant positions there. Upon returning, the detachment was ambushed. As a result of shelling, two volunteers of the Dudaev's International Detachment and two soldiers were killed. Support arrived for the intelligence officers, but the armored vehicle was destroyed by a mine. As a result, two more soldiers of the 15th Battalion died, and at least three soldiers were injured. On the same day, performing a combat mission near Hornitna, as a result of a mine explosion, a soldier of the 72nd Brigade was seriously wounded and died due to the loss of blood. On May 20, despite the agreement and withdrawal of heavy weapons, militants used self-propelled gun mounts. Near the village of Kamenka in the Volnovaha County, one soldier of the 20th Battalion of the Ukrainian Armed Forces died as a result of shelling. In Shurokhina, fighters of the Azov Battalion conducted a successful operation and eliminated three terrorists. Another six militants were injured. It should be understood that the active missions of the terrorists forced the Ukrainian command to respond adequately. This, in turn, led to the accumulation of heavy weapons near the demarcation line and a new spiral of escalation of hostilities. On May 21, near Shirokhina, one fighter of the Azov battalion was wounded. Near Shastya, a Ukrainian armored vehicle was shot down, from which one crew member was injured. As a result of shelling and explosions of mines during the day, three soldiers were killed in the ATO zone. About 30 shells exploded on the territory of the Avdivka coke chemical plant which resulted in the injury of two soldiers and the death of a plant worker. The plant administration stated that the total amount of material losses from the shelling was to the tune of 4 million US dollars. On the same day, the 27th so-called humanitarian aid convoy entered the territory of Ukraine. Given the dynamics of sending humanitarian aid convoys, it can be concluded that to support its hybrid army, the Kremlin imported an average of 1,000 tons of various cargoes per week. It is important to note that supported by Russian warehouses and storage bases, militants freely used ammunition and fuel. At the same time, the Ukrainian army with an impressive arsenal of weapons could not compete with that of the Russian side. One should understand that in parallel with retaining the front, there was a recovery and re-entry of equipment, training of new soldiers and replacement of those who demobilized after a year of service. And while Ukraine was conducting military operations in its own territory trying to minimize the damages, the Kremlin was interested in escalation of the war. On the one hand, Putin created problems in Donbass. He armed the local reactionary underclass, provided them with heavy weapons, fuel, ammunition and support from the Russian armed forces. Logically, a war broke out. In the end, it led to the destruction, breakdown of economic relations, unemployment and the overall deterioration of the economy. On the other hand, the head of the Kremlin offered humanitarian aid in the form of humanitarian convoys. He offered them benefits instead of jobs and he proposed a wonderful concept instead of the right to choose. Initially, a part of the concept was the so-called protection of the Russian-speaking population of Ukraine. But like many times before, on May 22, terrorists opened fire on the village of Luhanskia, where Russian-speaking people lived. It is no accident that Russian militants were called terrorists because as a result of shelling, not military facilities but civilian infrastructure suffered. Several apartment houses were destroyed, power lines were damaged, part of the city was left without gas. As a result of the main water pipe damaging, the water supply was stopped, including in the occupied Luhansk. 
In total, on May 22, Ukraine lost three soldiers. On May 23, shelling with mortars, automatic grenade launchers and even heavy artillery were recorded. Avdiivka again came under terrorist shelling. The local coking plant informed about 40 gaps that led to the suspension of its work. On the same day, there was an assassination attempt on the militant leader and Ghost Brigade commander Alexei Mozgovoy on the Alchevsk-Luhansk highway. Near the settlement of Mihailovka, his car was blown up and then fired upon by machine guns. As a result of the assault, Mosgovoy, his press secretary, two guards and driver were killed, and three more innocent local residents were accidentally killed. The so-called LPR prosecutor's office accused the Ukrainian special services of the assault. However, Mosgovoy, being popular among militants, was in opposition to the LPR authorities. He accused the latter of high treason and seriously criticized them. It became logical that the Kremlin does not need strong leaders in the occupied territories. Later, there was information about elimination of the odious commander by the Russian private military company Wagner. On May 24, Avdiivka was targeted by terrorists, and again, as a result of shelling, local residents suffered. Two were injured and one was killed. Street fighting and shelling continued in Shirokina. As a result of artillery shell bursts, two soldiers of the Donbass battalion were wounded and one of them was killed. On May 25, in the suburbs of Stonitsa Luhanska, a group of saboteurs that infiltrated Ukraine from Russia opened fire on an UAZ ambulance near the village of Siza. One soldier of the 53rd Brigade was killed and the second was seriously wounded. On the same day, in Shirokina, a fighter of the National Guard of Ukraine was injured. On the night of May 26, an anti-tank platoon of the Donbass battalion destroyed a Russian Kamaz truck with ammunition and infantry on board. The next day, near the settlement of Zolota, a fighter of the battalion Idar was killed. On May 27, near the village of Luhansk, a mine war took the lives of two more Ukrainian soldiers. And in Russia, the next 28th humanitarian aid convoy was prepared for dispatch. In May of 2015, weapons were used on average about 20 times per day in the ATO zone. Ukraine lost 46 of its defenders in the second part of May. Up to 100 local and visiting militants died in these local battles. Several hundred local residents sustained wounds of varying degrees of severity. During a month, Russia sent three convoys with 3,000 tons of cargo to the occupied territories. It was possible to avoid this if Russia had moderated its imperial ambitions. War is very costly in every sense of the word. Intensive fighting affects people's standard of living. Residents of frontline areas literally feel these changes. And to avoid spreading the virus of war inland, soldiers' bodies are used to cover the holes in the hybrid front. <laughs> A poorly equipped army has to pay for each failure of suppliers with lives. At the beginning of the Russian-Ukrainian war, the National Army of Ukraine was poorly equipped. For this reason, the Ukrainian government chose a course for the maximum pacification of the situation. In the midterm, this allowed to build spare defense lines and modernize communications and air defense systems. Bloody armistice helped develop the capacity to effectively counter the enemy.